Thank you very much. Darius James.
I'm doing a picture today called Last Days of Coney Island, my last film. And uh, every one of these guys gets credit on this film. As long as I'm alive, every film I'll do, they're going up again on their credits, even though. Because I wouldn't be here if they didn't do what they did. Plus some new animators. I got two Brooklyn animators on this film. I'm Colleen Cox and Mark Phillips. Are they here? Are they here tonight? Yeah. 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 So on these questions about these, I can't. And these were professional men. Irv Spence used to come in in the morning about like 2 o'clock, his work was finished. Every Friday he made 30, 35 feet of beautiful animation. There was no pressure on the studio. Um, these guys backed me, they loved what I was doing. They, they laughed their heads off, they couldn't believe it. At last they were free. I mean, they used to come to my office and say, Ralph, Irv, sitting in the doorway, Ralph, you really want me to do this? I said, yeah. He said, you really, really want me to do this? I said, yeah. Thank God. He ran away. Ralph, who was your fastest animator? Spence. Spence? Spence. Andy was the slowest, but he was the greatest. He did the Disney kind of central save of Virgil Ross wasn't bad. And I would say Spence and, and Manny Perez. Really? Manny Perez. It was, it was her. You couldn't touch her. You know. um, my question has to do. <clears throat> with the language of this film in terms of animation and history, that kind of thing. Yeah, I can sort of be difficult, sir. No, it's not difficult. Okay, like it. Yeah. Um, but I have to open up with this one question. Uh, you directed the uh, early Spider-Man cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> In, in the mid to late 60s. And <laughs> rumor, rumor, I heard, and I want you to confirm whether or not this rumor is true. The baseline on Spider Man, was that played by Charles Mingus? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, no, I, I have no idea. <laughs> Trying to get 20 minutes a week done, right, on a $12,000 budget, and all I was doing was I was in the camera room, okay? Yeah. And every and the film was short. If you uh, you've got to send it to the network, you know, at a certain length. So all I kept doing was adding Spider-Man swings. I was like, hey, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> this guy, I said, get the, out a stack of swings and swing background. And every time it was short, the camera said, they shooting swings. <laughs> and then I was swings and we play music. <laughs> I don't know. The was zero, not, I don't know. I, I, I understand he was picking up, like, session work. And he did that. I don't think so. I would have, yeah. if Mingus was there, I would have been there with him. <laughs> <laughs> I love Charles Mingus. Of course. You know, so what I'm saying is, no, Mingus wasn't there, right? No, he was there. <laughs> 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 Where would he be? <laughs> I'm not putting him down if he was there. I'm just saying if he was there, I, I would have known. Yeah. Um, Unless he looked like somebody else. Yeah, exactly. But that opens up the larger question. That wasn't the question. <laughs> I'm interested in, okay, first of all, um, almost from the beginning of American animation, there has been this relationship between jazz and animation, like a lot of American animated cartoons, specifically in the 20s, starting in the 20s, is driven by jazz Hollywood. That's right. Yeah, um, um, jazz polyrhythms in terms of narratives, the gags, that sort of thing. Um, the reason why I'm asking it, of course, because, you know, jazz is identified as a black musical medium. Absolutely. And this film speaks in a distinctly black voice on several levels. You know, musically, language-wise, story-wise. And I want to know 
how jazz came to influence the shape of American cartoons, uh, animated American cartoon animation. And I'll, I'll, I'll try. Uh, well, I don't want too much. I'm not a historian. I me mean, could answer that question better than I could. Um, jazz, to me, in, in the 50s and 60s and so forth, was everything. Uh, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, uh, Chet Baker, Jerry Mulligan. I could go on and on. I don't want the little modern jazz quartet. I listened to it. I loved it. And it inspired me. Um, the first jazz records I heard were Miles Davis in the early 60s. Uh, he did this French film called The Escalator. Or es the Escalator. And he did it directly to picture improvisation. He just walked in, him and Coltrane and a bunch of his guys, and played directly to the film. When you hear the music, you just cry. It's so beautiful. Many one of the best things Davis ever did, among other brilliant things. I've always loved jazz very much. Um, as far as black, so it always inspired uh, me, and it's, it's, it inspired the early cartoonists. Uh, certainly Fleischer loved jazz. Max Fleischer, he loved uh, Cab Calloway. Um, Music is everything in animated cartoons, and uh, it has always inspired me. I turn on jazz records or any kind of music records, and you lie on your couch, and you go through the scenes in your head. If you pick the right music for the right scene emotionally, and you let the music play, it'll start helping you write the scene. You know, I, used to, I cut all my um, music tracks before the, the real composers come in and ruin them. <laughs> I cut them with the great jazz grace. In Fritz, before Fritz blew up, I cut Day in the Life. So the entire, the entire lead into how he blew up was Day in the Life and the conclusion. I used that for the timing. Because again, having no pencil test, I was leading on the stuff that would help me get the timing right, which is everything in a cartoon. Uh, the reason why, the reason, where that came, the question came from, when I first entered, No, it's 89. Right. Um, he said something. We were talking about George Harrington, who right. is like an enormous influence on the world. <coughs> right. Several sequences in uh, Coonskin right. that we, we can see the George Harrington influence on uh, uh, Crazy Cat. Now, the thing that you were to was that talking about the fact that you listen to Errol Garner, for example, and looking at a crazy cat comic show, you know, the, the Errol Garner music actually opened up the kinetic quality of a still form. That's right. Page. Absolutely. And I wanted you to expand on that. Well, to me the blues are everything. In other words, my animation to me represents the blues, which I think is a great American idiom, and all jazz stems from the blues. The kind of blues that I started to love was the kind that was done in the 20s and 30s on old records and scratching. The recording is terrible, the singers are great, they all sing with their heart. And I felt that animation, if you have no money, should aim for the blues. If the last days of Coney Island that I'm doing today, I'm animating the blues. In other words, the characters fall apart, they're scratching. But they all have heart and soul. Um, to me, if you spend two, this is, this is tough now. I'm going to be careful here. But it, I was lucky because of my low budgets. And why was I lucky? Because all the guys have a lot of money to make films. Spend all their time making the animation perfect, because they have a lot of money. And all their time working on special effects, because they have all this money. And because they've got so much money to make it, um, they make, have to make sure everything is great. Now, as an animation director, if you spend all your time on special effects and all your time on making the animation superlative, you're not spending your time on writing and rewriting the movie. There's only so much time you could spend it on. But because you think you're doing all this great work, which you are, that you're taking care of the film, you're really screwing the film and screwing yourself. Because you can't spend your time on anything. I had no special effects money, no pencil test money. 
I cannot redo my animation. So what do I spend my time on? Storyboard, character design, background design, and rewriting stuff. That's why my film might be still around. I put everything I had into what is really important to the film. This is the quality of animation. That should be great if it's great. But if it's serviceable to what your emotion is, and your emotions are on the screen, you're a filmmaker. And that's all I cared about. I told We're going to try to squeeze in our own questions, but we want to go out to the audience right now and see if there's any questions out there. Uh, uh, I'm going to, he raised his hand first. I'm going to go with him, and then I'll get back to you. Sir, did your relationship with Scott and Carter's come first, or did the role of the film come first, and how did you guys write that song? What? Ralph, the question, the question, <laughs> the question was, was, did your relationship with Scott and Carter's come first, or did it come as a result of this film, and how did you guys write that song? We didn't write this song. I wrote this song. <laughs> <laughs> he played the ukulele, you know, and the sang, so he didn't write it. All of us. So I put out something here. Uh, I was at I was friends for yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, no. Scatman Crothers I hired for the movie. I met him. Everyone knows Scatman. Yeah. He was perfect. Charles Gordon, I read his play, No Place to Be Somebody or something. So I was going to do as a live action movie, so I got to know Charles actually. He wasn't that well in those days, and uh, I hired him to play preacher. Okay, Charles Gordon was a brilliant man of letters ever. Um, Barry White wanted to be in the film. He said, hey, Ralph, I want to be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Barry. <laughs> I used to write poems, all the poems in the um, in Kuskin. I write, I write, I write poems so I can understand what picture I'm making. Then I decided to put the poems in the movie and animate them. Um, I brought this to Scatman as it seemed. He says, I got it. See, he took the lyrics and he sat down and did what he did. He played, he played the thing and we did it in two takes. Um, and that was our collaboration. <laughs> and then Ralph, did you, but the question was, did you know him before the film? No. No, you didn't know him. No, but he's black. What's to know? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I would just want to... All my friends were black. You know? uh, a lot, I, I wanted to interject that a lot of Blackville, black vaudeville performers, okay, who worked in, you know, the, the shining teeth grinning thing, okay. That was what. Him. Nah, it wasn't. Let me finish what I'm saying, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, they actually felt a lot of resentment. There's, um, in terms of this, this, this role that they had been cast, in. and that particular song gave him, uh, Scatman, an opportunity to express that anger. And this, I'm coming up with this from my interviews with different directors who had worked with people like. You know, step fetch it, you know, that their character caricatures of blacks were in fact, you know, hostile reactions to how um, they were perceived or how black people were perceived. Well, you know, uh, with Darius, I wasn't going to bring it up, but Darius did. It shows you how, shows me how perceptive he is. Uh, I went over to Scat and I said, This is your time to get even, do this. He read it and he said, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I told him, this is your time to get even, and uh, what Darius said, he, I had no way of knowing how he understood that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's great to see this movie on the big screen, it's, it's a fantastic movie. Is there a reason that Al Lewis didn't take credit as the voice of the grandfather? He's not in the credits. What grandfather? Or oh, it's the godfather, excuse me. Is that Al Lewis? It's Al Lewis. He yeah. didn't take credit? No. Well, you know, Susan Terrell didn't take credit for her great voice track and quizzes she did the narration. And what it was, was they were embarrassed. Because in those days, animation was a, a, a crumbling industry, and it was beneath them. 
They needed the money, so a lot of guys who made a deal with them said they didn't want credit. They would do the voice work, I just wanted the voice anyhow. Uh, it happened gotten quite a bit, so that, that's why. Now, uh, that's the way it was in animation in my day. Today it's different. But they were ashamed to be in Way back then. Um, I heard that uh, Al Sharpton actually protested the, the one week that the movie actually plays. Does he ever issue an apology to you for that? The question is, is you heard uh, Al Sharpton protested, has he ever apologized to you? Um, <laughs> no, uh, Al Sharpton caused uh, the film to close down. He caused me to fire all my black animators. Uh, he, he stopped me from making Kuzkin 2, 3, and 4. Mm. Al Sharpton's <laughs> <laughs> simple savior um, was a horrible person to this film. We tell you the story of Museum of Modern Art, true story. It's the last time in New York, so I'll tell you. The picture screen of Museum of Modern Art, the, uh, it's premiere. No one has seen it before. And I show up, and Sharpton is in the back with all these guys with clubs. The place is packed like this. The picture's over, and Sharpton starts walking up to the front to beat the hell out of me, because I'm up on the microphone and just scream and tell everyone to sit in the seat, and nobody moved. They're disgusted. And he turns around, he's halfway up the aisle. I'm the short little guy. He's halfway up the aisle. He turns around, all these big guys aren't moving. <laughs> they all like the movie. They're <laughs> not moving. So I'm on the microphone. I tell Sharpton, why you middle class sell out? You <laughs> kick my ass? Oh, get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah. He left. They all left. The guys didn't do anything. They liked the movie. They said, come on, out, let's go. So all these guys were sick. They went. Next day, what the guys did to get me, that must have been Sharpton, they went to Paramount Pictures, and they blocked the elevator. So all the guys, the bosses who work at the top of Paramount Pictures in New York, right? weren't able to get out of work because every elevator was blocked by big black guys with giant clubs. <laughs> you guys were the funniest. <laughs> we're going to hurt anything. Well, my guys don't know that. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, and I get this call from Paramount to my producer, Al Ruddy. Al Ruddy says, he says, the guy who runs Paramount, Barry Diller, Barry Diller is screaming, what's the back sheet? What is a match? <laughs> 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 and, they, and they threw the film out. And they threw the film out. So Sharpton did me a lot of, I'm laughing about it because I won. And I don't really care. But Sharpton did a lot of uh, harm to what I was trying to do is get black animation going because um, it's so wonderful. I mean, the point is everything. The sense of humor, the literature, the, the music. I mean, it's it's right for animation. It's you know, probably the most creative people in the world are black people, I think. And, uh, so I was trying to get that whole thing going, and he stopped it. Studios wouldn't, wouldn't allow me to do another one. So he hurt. I would never apologize. He never apologized. He went on to his own talk show, I think. Any questions? This side? Right here. I hate it. Now, as far as 
Well, do you have a final question? How is that something that you wanted to realize as part of the telling of the story? Well, first of all, I had a very interesting experience when I was about 8 to 12 years old. I forget. My family moved to Washington, D.C. to open up a grocery store. My father came from Russia with my mother. We were an immigrant family. And he was working very hard, very little money. We all were poor. And we heard, my father heard, from his uncles or something, that nobody wanted to put a, a grocery store in a black neighborhood. No one wanted to serve the black community. And my father thought it would be a good piece of business to go to me and care. You know, yeah, people are people. That's how I grew up. So we moved to a black neighborhood in Washington, D.C. called Harvey <coughs> Bottom. All my friends were black. The entire neighborhood was black. And, I, and uh, all my friends were black. And I learned so much from these guys. If Kuzkin started anywhere, it started there. In other words, I went to black barbershops. I went to black movies. They had black cowboy movies. We went there, I was eight years old, all the girls sat in the lap, we had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that was difficult was, you know, this is integration. I had to walk 40 blocks to a white school. The black school was across the street from my store, but I, they wouldn't let me in there. All my friends were dragging me in every morning, and the teachers kept throwing me out. You know, it was, it's like, so anyhow, so I had to walk 40 blocks with my sister and 40 blocks back every day because it was integration. And the high school was Lily White. We used to have uh, milk and wafer cookies every month. <laughs> now, me and my black friends, we used to figure out how to rob my store. <laughs> <laughs> we used to sit outside planning when my sister would turn the back and my mother would be in the back. We'd run in and grab the Twinkie. Yeah, it worked brilliantly. <laughs> that's how I grew up, and that's where Coonskin started. You know, I can't explain that experience. When I got back to Brooklyn, uh, I ran faster than everybody. <laughs> it could be a white kid that could touch me all so fast. <laughs> and yeah, we used to walk around with June bugs. We used to, in the summertime in Washington, with these giant bugs about this big. And we all used to tie cotton to the legs and walk down the street to them spitting over our heads and completely tore out one of their legs. <laughs> 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 I like his question because he asks a question that directly addresses the narrative strategies in the film and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of uh, narrative strategies that are specific to black oral culture and uh, black literary culture. I mean you can go back to the title itself. Uh, Coonskin the film was originally called Coonskin No More. Right? which is makes reference to the title of an old black satirical novel of the 30s called Black No More. That's right. You see. <laughs> um, but you can see these references throughout the film, like uh, Savior Simple, Langston Hughes, uh, right. Mannequin, uh, Spook Who Sat By The Door, you know, and, uh, and, uh, the obviously the obvious, you know, uh, Iceberg Slim and Donald Goyne's references. You know. read the Iceberg Slim at the end? Huh? He was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Iceberg Slimming, that's what's got there. That's yeah. what you thought. That's what's that yeah. yeah. You know, in, in terms of the, 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 the noir crime aspects of uh, film, I you know, there, I, the, but the thing that I was really <laughs> impressed by was the, the soliloquy, in the jazz soliloquy, the spoken word soliloquy of the woman. Yes. Um, with, you know, the, what's his ass? The cockroach. The cock that, that, you know, that's actually public ones. That was like before, um, uh, for colored girls who considered suicide <laughs> with rainbow was enough. Well, you know, what, what the, I hate to break your bubble, but one of the things, <laughs> one of the things that always amazed me is, that, you know, black ain't too hard to figure out. They're human. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing that's so special. I know the people. I love 